many thousand years ago, there was a yogi whose name was Sunira. We believe Sunira was just the next generation after Saptarishis. He lived and worked in the mountains which are presently in Nepal. And she took on an impossible project. Sunira saw that human consciousness could be evolved if you produce a perfect human being who could render this to all sorts of people. In a way, he comes from the tradition of Shiva, somewhere it's his dream to build another being like that. He wants to build a living Shiva once again, a perfect teacher for the world who, who is completely multidimensional, not this kind of teaching or that kind of teaching. As Shiva gave, explored the whole human consciousness and human body in every possible way, he wants that kind of a living being. So he started building the energy body for that kind. And then he believed that he could build a physical body on top of that and let him lose in the world. With a lifespan of a few hundred or thousand years, so that he will transform the whole world by the time his time is done. So he started working on this project. And of course he died unfulfilled. So here and there, down these forty thousand years, many ambitious yogis picked up the same project that Sunira had left and tried to reconstruct this energy body of a perfect teacher who can transform human consciousness. They call him Maitreya. Maitreya means a friend a true friend to the humanity, to come and change humanity, the world teacher. Generation after generation, many yogis try to continue to work on the same half-made project of Sunira. It's always been in the yogic lore, but in the last century it came to the surface it came to social knowledge because the theosophists worked on it. Anibiscent Ladbita and Madam, whatever her name, I can never pronounce, Blavatsky. All three of them took this project up. They said, we are going to make it. They amassed a vast amount of occult knowledge, probably for the first time in the last few hundred years. And definitely for the first time, not in a traditional way but in a modern way, they took up this project. And they tried to locate this being, this unfinished project, they want to take it up and complete it. Some work was done. They had the knowledge, but they did not have the capability. 
they acquired much information, but they could not acquire the necessary means to do anything like that. Twice they made serious effort to simply declare that they have completed the project, the perfect being has come. But it did not work. Another parallel line was also being drawn for the last couple of millenniums where another set of yogis who were aware of this Sunira's glorious but quite impossible project, they started working upon a similar force to create a similar possibility but with a completely different understanding of the same creating a perfect being, but not as a human being, not in human form because putting it into a human being as such a possibility, human system has all the capabilities but still it doesn't have the necessary integrity of boundary to hold it. There are previous experiences of creating or attempting to create Dhyanalingas in many places. Any number of projects have started in the last two thousand, three thousand years and they have been abandoned halfway because of some problem or the other. In Bhojpur they attempted uh, a Dhyana Linga about a thousand years ago, little more than thousand years ago. This was supported by a local king, so it was hugely funded and they built a magnificent temple which is half done and the rest of the plants they drew it on the stone, you know, because there were no drawing boards. They flattened up a rock and they made an elaborate plan of the temple in all detail, the architectural thing on the stone. They had a grand plan, a beautiful setting and everything but half completed it stopped because of certain things. The lingam itself, they worked on it for more than three years. They had fourteen people working on it, one yogi who started this whole process. But this yogi worked for over two, two years and produced these fourteen people, seven men and seven women, of enormous or extraordinary accomplishment and they started working. They created this lingam almost ninety-five percent done. But at that time an invasion happened. The invaders came. found these people in certain states which whatever looked freakish for them and they attacked. When they attacked, his left foot was chopped off. Because of this damage in the body, he could not continue. So he decided, but they will merge themselves into the lingam and complete the work. So they asked another yogi, trained another yogi to lock the energy. This yogi left their bodies and merged into the lingam. But the other yogi who was supposed to do this was so overwhelmed by this situation that he could not lock it. Because they did not lock it in time, the lingam just cracked up. Even now you can see, it is, it's a straight crack in the lingam, about three to four inches is just opened up. Now they patched it up with lime. The archaeological department has patched it up with lime, but it just cracked.
Building such structures has been the want of many yogis because creating tools for enlightenment, not just as teachings, not just as practices that one can do, but living tools that people can walk through, living tools by which people can be impacted towards that process has always been the great desire of the yogis. One of them who had such a desire fixed me up for the job. My physical proximity with him was just for a few minutes. It is in these few moments that this fabulous crafty man enslaved me for his project. Everything that I did was around it because it was my guru's dream and it was his vision that the Dhyanalinga has to be established. This is my guru's will and grace. I think I must tell you something about the madness from where I come. After two lifetimes of heartbreaking sadhana, very intense, very truly heartbreaking sadhana, these two lifetimes I was referred to by people as Shiva Yogi. And When it was needed, when my guru appeared, and when he felt he… that he did not feel fit to touch me, he touched me with his stick. And everything that he that needs to be realized was realized. I was at the very peak of anything can be. So, that being was uh, referred to as uh, Shiva Yogi trying to fulfill the mission that was put into him didn't work, came back again. I said, Guru Sri Brahma, tried very hard almost successful but couldn't fix the goodwill in the society because the intensity of who he is could not be understood in the social circumstances. He couldn't fulfill that. He prepared a few people and then went up the mountain. He was checking himself, why has he failed? He's got everything. Why is it it didn't happen? He knew it's not that he lacks the competence, it's just that he did not garner the social support that was needed. So he went up the mountain for the last time. Before going up, he announced here at the foothills, 
a few of his disciples gathered. They said, what now? He said, even Tirpi were one, that means this one will be back again. And he went up the mountain for the last time. And he did a rare thing. He left his body through all his seven chakras at the same time. This is… he's just checking himself. He knows it's not so, but still the first blame should be on you when something doesn't work. So he's checking in case I'm not good or I'm not good enough. So he left his body through all his seven chakras this phenomenal energy, this very distinct energy which is nowhere else you can experience on the seventh hill. It's very, very different from anything that you would find anywhere. It's distinctly different. So with that done, he knew it's what is the problem is you didn't handle the circumstance properly. This round when we came, we planned everything to a point where we decided a few people that I need, where they are born, in which room, how, everything was planned, it went accordingly. people needed for the consecration, I place them in the right kind of places so that everything comes together at the right time. In spite of that, took it eighteen years of preparation in this life to put it together, to put the people together, to remind them of their past, to get them there. Now this is too fairy tales for you, but this is something that's a living reality for us. So the consecration process itself took three and a half years, a very intense process. People who witness these things, their lives are never the same again. Things that they had not imagined in their wildest dreams, they witnessed, they still can't believe that it actually happened in their presence. Yogi Sunira, he worked through his lifetime and towards the end of his life, when this dream of creating a perfect being remained unfulfilled, Yogi Sunira made a prophecy that long time from now, long, long time from now, this work that I have started will find fulfillment and reverberate not here but in the green hills of the south. Our hills are green. We are in the south. So whatever Sunira's prophecy has come true but not the way he thought it would, Dhyana Linga is like a living guru. The role of a guru in a spiritual seeker's life is not just about giving teachings and guidances. The most fundamental thing why a spiritual seeker seeks a guru is because a guru can ignite his energies into a different dimension. That aspect of guru's role in a spiritual seeker's life 
is very well fulfilled by the Dhyana Linga. Once a person is in the sphere of Dhyana Linga, he cannot escape the sowing of the spiritual seed of liberation within himself.